another edition of the Physio Tutors podcast. Today we have our first ever returning guests, uh, Ben Matthews and Glenn Robbins. Today we're going to be talking about the hip and different pathologies within the hip. And yeah, let, let's just get straight into it. Glenn, maybe you want to give a quick reintroduction to yourself and then uh, we'll get going with uh, Ben and then get started looking at some of the different pathologies. So, um, again, Sunny, thanks for having us back in Amsterdam. Um, always great to, to visit. Um, we're talking about hips this time, so uh, something very close to mine and Ben's heart. We've been teaching on the hips together for uh, six years, something like that. Um, really complex area for clinicians to get involved with. Um, I started my journey in hips many years ago. My first um, role in a private clinic, I... Um, worked in a clinic where they had a policy that only male therapists could treat male groins and I was the only male therapist so I used to get tons and tons of, of groins adductor issues footballers rugby players and the like um, and yeah it sort of sparked an interest in the hip from there really um, and I think it's a bit of a a bit of a black hole you know that people can get lost in so there's a lot going on there um, there's referral patterns from other areas lumbar spine SIJ there is um, normally two or three things going on at the same time. So I think it's understandable that people struggle with that. When I look back to my undergrad and even my postgrad training, um, the hip assessment was limited to, um, do we think it's arthritis? You know, should we do a quadrant test to confirm it's the hip? Um, there was talk of impingement, but there was not really any um, in-depth assessment on that. So I think, you know, it's a relatively new diagnosis and um, the assessment techniques and the treatment techniques are, are in their early stages as a result of that. So it's a really, um, really exciting area to be involved in because I think we're going to see lots of changes over the next year or two years, five years, 10 years. We're going to see um, the, the way that we, we treat them, the way that we rehab them changing as a result as well and our success rates improving uh, ideally. Okay, great. And Ben, why don't you... Give a quick reintroduction to yourself and then start uh, discussing some of the different pathologies that you might see within the hip. Uh, thanks, uh, Sonny. I enjoyed really the last time when we called us for the running. So this, this session will be looking into hip, one of my uh, core areas, which I get involved um, on a weekly basis. So I've been a physio for, since 1998 and for the last 10 years I've been focusing mainly on lower limb. My uh, NHS job, I work as an advanced practice physio where predominantly I look at people uh, failed rehab and waiting to see a surgeon. So I work closely with uh, a lower limb um, hip surgeon who does a lot of hip scopes. So I see them pre-op, um, you know, do the appropriate scans and then consult with the surgeon and then list them for the surgeries as well. So um, this is sort of uh, one of the fastest growing orthopedic surgical specialty. So there's a lot of awareness in the last five to 10 years on uh, conditions like hip impingement, hip dysplasia and extra articular pathology. So um, it's an area uh, really passionate about mainly to increase awareness as well as looking into the protocols as well. One of the things we emphasize on the courses is the hip and groin is at least 20 years behind uh, conditions like ACL uh, or patellar femoral pain. We are very early in the part of the journey. So uh, we don't have any high quality evidence at this stage. So that what makes it exciting. So if you've got a young grad physio or somebody who wants to specialize, hip and groin is definitely the area to go because we're going to see a lot more uh, evidence, more protocols um, unlike other areas which might have reached, uh, you know, their uh, capacity. So um, uh, that's sort of my journey. So when you talk about hip pathologies, most people are aware of um, your elderly hip arthritis. So that's not the area where I deal with. Most of my patients, they fall within that 16 to 45 age group. So generally, if patients come to with hip and groin pain after the age of 45, 50, uh, more likely to be early osteoarthritis. The conditions like hip impingement, hip dysplasia tends to happen more when you are in your 20s and 30s. And there are conditions which happen when you're a teenage uh, or as a child, like parties, um, you know, slipped capital ephesis, which happens when you're a teenage. So, um, um, so my population group, I see mostly are chronic. Most of my symptoms I see are usually three months plus, and usually it's articular pathology. So it's either a, a hip impingement or hip dysplasia. So generally, a simple rule is if somebody comes with acute onset of hip and groin pain, generally it's more muscular, like adductors or hip flexors or glute med. If somebody comes to a clinic uh, with chronic hip and groin pain, like 
three months, six months, one year, two year, uh, seven out of 10, it will be from your hip joint. So it amazes me even now, like I see people, you know, been treated for two, three years and they have been treated as tight hip flexes or capital tightness and nobody has really looked into the hip joint. So the number one cause for chronic hip and groin is no surprise is the hip joint. So if somebody comes with chronic hip and groin pain, the first place you need to look at is definitely hip joint. And so when we look into the hip pathologies, um, non-osteoarthritis population, uh, the most common has to be femoral acetabular impingement. There's a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, bust in the media. Um, a lot of physios are getting involved into that. So that's your sort of your most common presentation you see. So when you talk about hip impingement, um, your typical profile, uh, we can put that into three groups. So the most common profile would be a young female uh, in, his, uh, in her late 20s or early 30s coming with chronic hip and groin pain, uh, worse with sitting, worse with squatting, uh, worse with rotational sport. She might have clicking or catching. Uh, she might have limping. She might have night pain. So, and the pain can be anywhere from the groin, anterior thigh, could be lateral hip. So it's more like a nagging pain, which gets worse with sitting and uh, uh, prolonged squatting and they can't train at the gym. So that's your normal profile. The second profile is you see is a young male, usually between 18 to 22, uh, who is doing rotational sports like football, hockey, basketball or things like that and uh, his performance is getting affected so he's struggling with uh, his groin pain and the third group i see in the clinic is the middle age group uh, weekend warrior type usually from 35 to sort of 45 50 who suddenly do too much too soon you know they're suddenly starting doing triathlon or um, ultra marathon or doing five classes of crossfit a week um, and they come with a nickel pain so this is your classical three presentations you see um, based on um, uh, clinical findings of uh, hip impingement and um, the pain usually is uh, worse with flexion-based activities. So one common thing they'll always say is it's worse with sitting. So one of the questions I'll always ask, how many minutes can you sit without pain? So that will give you an idea of irritability. So some will say, I can only sit for 15 minutes. Some people will say 45 minutes. And in the gym, they'll struggle with the squat. They'll struggle with cycling. They'll struggle with rowing. And anything with twisting, like kicking, all those sort of things are really important. They might not re remember an incident of injury. It's very rare they have a traumatic onset. Most will start as a niggle, as a stiffness, and then it'll sort of uh, go on to more uh, uh, stopping them from uh, the symptoms. Very rare for them to have night pain. Um, if you're getting night pain, it could be just because they are, uh, you know, having a flare up or a labral involvement. Another misconception which uh, which is quite common in the media, especially is about labral tears. It's very different from meniscal. For example, in meniscal of the knee, you can have a, a normal knee and a meniscal pathology. The hip is totally different. It's very rare to see a labral tear, a symptomatic labral tear in a hip patient with a normal hip pattern. So normally when somebody comes to me in a clinic and they say they've got a labral tear, I'm more interested in their hip profile. I want to know, is it osteoarthritis? So there are the most three, four common reasons for label tear in a symptomatic population is uh, early osteoarthritis, hip impingement, hip dysplasia, or hypermobility, laxity. So it's very rare to see uh, a chronic label tear without on its own, except when you have trauma. Suppose you fall from a horse or you've been involved in a car accident, then you can get traumatic label tear. That is less than 10% of the, of the reason. So generally, a label tear is not a primary diagnosis. So that's where it's different from the knee. So uh, label tear for me, I'm not interested in label tear. I want to know what's happening in the hip. So that's the main reason on that as well. So that's sort of the main group. And the second group I see a lot is a young female who come with hip dysplasia. So I need to make it a clear distinction. I'm not talking about childhood, childhood hip dysplasia. That's what's picked up when you're born, like six months. We're talking about adolescent hip dysplasia. Usually becomes symptomatic as a teenage girl, um, and then it can be uh, in your 20s. 80% of your hip dysplastic patients will be females. Uh, so usually the difference between hip dysplasia and uh, hip impingement is with the dysplastic hips, it's more with weight bearing activities like walking, running and jumping, plyometric abil abilities. They have a very similar presentation. So I was lucky to be involved with Mike Riemann on a systematic review where we looked into test on hip dysplasia. And it's a difficult, it's a difficult condition to diagnose without an X-ray. So uh, if you get a female patient with chronic hip and groin pain, then I'd be thinking more hip impingement or hip dysplasia. If it's a male, it more likely be impingement. To make it difficult for us, even harder, 
nearly all your patients uh, who come to you with chronic hip and groin pain will definitely will have a muscle element as well. So they'll have an adductor element, they'll have a hip flexor element, uh, they'll have a glute med element. So uh, I mentioned many times elsewhere that hip impingement comes with its friends. It's very rare to see hip impingement on its own. So they'll have a muscle element, they'll have a back element. So this is a combination of different things. So just to summarize here is um, looking at the age group, if it's 45, 50 plus, it's more likely to be early OA. Below 16, it's a different pathologies. Between 16 to 45, it's chronic, more than three months, more likely to be articular pathologies like hip impingement and hip dysplasia. So this is sort of a general rules to, to consider when you see a patient with a hip pathology. All right. So you mentioned there sports are a risk factor in particular age groups. Can you expand on the risk factors a little more for us? Yeah. So that's quite important because this fact is a uh, etiology. One of the questions I'll always ask my hip patient is how active you were between the age of eight to 18. Your childhood activities makes a big difference. If you've been really been sporty in your childhood, there's evidence that it helps in reshaping your bone. You're more likely to develop cam morphology if you've been involved with rotational sports. So very rarely you're born with cam. It happens around the age of 10 to 12. So especially in boys who play a lot of rotational sports. There'll be good research coming from a Dutch group from, uh, you know, Agricola group who's done his PhD on that, where they've shown that uh, boys who play a lot of rotational sports develop around the age of 10 to 12. So your childhood activity makes a big impact on the shape of the hip as well. So your, those sort of factors are really important. And uh, I'll also ask if, them, if they've got childhood hip diseases. So those are the important thing. There's also some genetic factors as well. If your brother or sister had a hip impingement, you're more likely to do two to three times more likely to develop symptoms as well. So I'll ask them about their family history, especially the siblings. And uh, if I'll also ask about the parents. So if a patient says to me, my mother had hip replacement at the age of 40, uh, very young for obviously, then I'll be more concerned. So there's a genetic element. Uh, there's a training element. Um, so it's a complex. So your childhood history is really important. It's very rare to see hip impingement in patients who have not been active. So high level of a sporting f activities is a risk factor for um, developing these pathologies. Great. So we've touched on what we will ask the patient and the risk factors to start connecting dots in our own heads. How are we then going to transition into assessing the patients? Yeah, so this is, I think, where there's often a bit of difficulty because it's there's so much to assess yeah it's, it's quite a complex region and um you do have these interactions from msk and other and non-msk conditions as well so i think you know you, you have to be mindful of um red flags yeah so we we talk about sam so stress fractures avascular necrosis mets secondary mets if they've got history of cancer um, particularly testicular or cervical cancer um so you need to be mindful of that obviously you want to um, rule those out um, and then you want to work out is it articular or is it extra articular um, quite often there'll be a combination of, of two <laughs> yes in fact um, most of the clients we see so again just to, to um, clarify the, the purposes of the talk today is looking at people that have had pain presenting for sort of three months or longer yeah so we're not looking at your acute adductor strains where they've played football on the Saturday yeah so these are people that have been experiencing pain for three months or longer and in that client group, 70% of the time, you're going to be dealing with more than one um, pathology. Yeah, so they'll have a combination of a um, symptomatic um, hip joint with a glute med pathology or an adductor pathology coexisting with that, or maybe they'll have a lumbar component, you know, so you have to have, to have a system. So um, we use a layering concept, which we took from uh, Peter Drauvich, uh, paper back in 2012 where we go through in a very uh, specific kind of order to make sure that we don't miss anything out essentially. Yeah. So we'll go through four layers. So the first layer, we're going to be looking at them um, moving, looking at them walking. So um, even simple things like watching their gait, start from the top, work your way down. Do they have any trunk lean? Do they have any hip drops? You know, what's happening with their knees? Are they turning in? Are they turning out? Are they kind of pigeon toed? Are they walking like Charlie Chaplin? You know, so um, gives you a lot of information. Looking from the side, um, what's their stride length like? Have they got a, a limp? Have they got an antagonic um, gait? Are they taking short steps? What happens if you change that? What happens if you get them to take long steps? Does that increase their pain? Um, then we'll watch them move. So I think it's important you look at them squat for a couple of reasons. Um, often, as, uh, as Ben mentioned, squatting can be problematic. Yeah. So when we assess them squat, we're looking at does it provide does it provoke pain? Um, are they able to get a good depth without pain? 
and particularly in this female group that we mentioned are they squatting in um, the most efficient way for their pathology so the, the common uh, movement pattern we see with this group specifically is an increased forward lean you know so as they squat they're um, hinging excessively um, at the hips and if you combine that with a sudden spike in um, training volume so they've just joined a, a local gym and they're doing a um, three times as many classes a week and they're doing tons and tons of squats then you can see that how that might be a, a, a important part of the picture um, then we want to look at lumbar spine you know sij but what we don't want to fall in the trap of is um, stopping the assessment and doing a full lumbar assessment and, and it's not necessary yeah so if there are ways that we can differentiate um, that lead us down the right track early on then that's important so i mean an example of that might be looking at someone um flexing their back and they're getting groin pain so you might think it could be an upper lumbar spine issue it could be a hip issue just doing simple movements like a weighter's bow and um, working on the pelvic tilt if, if you can um, flex with a weight with a, a neutral or an extended spine and the pain's still there it might make you think it's more from the hip so just making your assessment a little bit more efficient in that way and then we'll work into um, layer two which is more looking at the extra articular um, structures yeah so um, we do a combination of palpation, um, stretch testing, and, and manual muscle testing on the hip flexors, the abductors, the adductors, uh, the rec fem, um, and that will help us identify if there's any issues there. Layer three, we'll be looking more at the labrum. Yeah, so we'll be doing label tests. Uh, we'll be looking at the capsule. Maybe we'll be looking at some um, ligamentum teres tests as well. And then layer four, we leave till the end. So layer four is the area that most of us are familiar with. And again, going back to my kind of... Um, undergrad training and my postgrad training this was where we were directed to jump straight in on you know oh, i think it's the hip well let's do a let's do a quadrant test um the problem with these uh, clients is if you do that straight off the bat you're going to provoke pain um probably too much pain and then it will cloud the rest of your assessment so it's important you get all the information before you just jump straight in on the the most provocative tests yeah so it can cloud your assessment so that everything's painful from that point on so i think it's having um having those systems in place where you're going through it in an order so you're not just jumping on um your bias if you if you um spot something in the in the glute med for example make sure you're not falling in the trap of treating a glute med tendinopathy for four months and it's not getting any better and you've missed the articular component you know or vice versa you've you've picked up that there's a joint issue but maybe the majority of their pain is coming from their lumbar spine and you've you've um, not identified that early on so it's having a strategy in place so that you can assess a wide range um, of conditions and that you can prioritize what you're going to um, focus on in those early stages of um, rehab what about the location of the pain is that of any relevance for you guys when you're looking at these sorts of patients absolutely yeah i mean I've, again i find it quite interesting if someone has pain in the knee we assume it's the knee yeah if someone has pain in the ankle we assume it's the ankle someone has pain around uh, the groin um we're often quite quickly quite quick to jump on um distal areas yeah so if someone's turning up with groin pain um then i'm assuming it's the hip until i kind of prove otherwise yeah obviously you can get groin pain from elsewhere um you often will get this c sign yeah so people are familiar with the c sign if you take your hand and cup it around the top of your groin you will often get a c sign um distribution of pain but not always so um a lot of our clients present with just lateral hip pain yeah so misdiagnosed for a long time with glute med uh, tendon issues which they often have as well um, but they've not had any groin pain for that period of time. So for me, if they've got pain in the groin, if they've got a C sign, if they've got lateral hip pain that's persisting and not um, in keeping with a, a normal um, GTPS, uh, or if they've got deep buttock pain, then you could consider that as a referral pattern from the hip, potentially. So those quadrant layers that you mentioned, what is it that you're using to then sort of differentiate between them? So with a gluteal tendon, we'll get them standing on one leg initially. Can they hold that balance? We'll often increase the load. So a lot of these clients are quite athletic. So just standing on one leg for 20, 30 seconds isn't, isn't demanding enough. So you can place a dumbbell in the opposite hand, which increases the load through the glute med. Um, that's often enough to ramp them up, or you can get them to do a bit of exercise beforehand, a bit of um, cutting and pivoting that might provoke it. Um, you will do a variety of tests. So we do a derotation test for the glute med where we bring them into um, flexion 
and rotation and then we load them through rotation there. Uh, palpating the glute med tendon obviously should provoke pain with that as well and a Fabus test is often positive for a glute med tendinopathy as well but obviously bear in mind that will often be positive for the hip joint also yeah so there's i think clinically we can we can reliably diagnose a glute med tendinopathy without imaging um whether it's in isolation or not that's where the kind of skill comes in but we do know um that for the majority of clients, we can get a good result with gluteal tendinopathies with, with rehab if we give them a decent amount of um, sessions and a, a good in-depth rehab program. So if they're not um, resolving, if they're not improving in a perceived time, then it would increase the suspicion that the hip joint is, is at play underneath as well. We've mentioned the different risk factors uh, would you say there are particular key indicators maybe signs or symptoms that may push you down one particular path obviously as you mentioned as a clinician we need to keep our wide field of vision but are there particular things that if you heard would push you one way sort of to develop a clinical picture for you so i think with the hip um often groin pain with which we've mentioned yeah so if, if your clients are experiencing groin pain if they're limping yeah, I think that's another important sign as well that often rules in the, the hip. Um, if they've got a lack of extension or internal rotation, when you look at them on the couch as well, or pain in those movements, then that would lead me to thinking um, more along the lines of the hip joint. Uh, if they're getting their pain when they're sitting, I think that's a really big one. Yeah, So if you're sitting down watching TV and that's sore, then that's definitely going to raise the suspicion that it's coming more from the hip joint, particularly if it's that groin area. And that's a big um a big way that we gauge their irritability as well so it's more important to me about your sitting tolerance than it is about your exercise tolerance in a way you know so if you can go out and do a, a, a 4k run we said often the running isn't so provocative for these hip clients but you can't sit and watch a 20 minute show with your family then you're, you're still placed in that high irritability um, category in my eyes so yeah looking at things like sitting tolerance um, often with the label, uh, when the labrum starts to become a big player in the pain, um, they'll have a lot of, of night pain yeah, and their symptoms will persist for a prolonged period of time. So they might be limping for a couple of days. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of subjective and objective markers that would um, lead us more down that route. And again, when we're assessing them, if you're um, controlling lumbar movements, for example, and emphasizing hip movements and that's increasing or maintaining the pain or then again, that's going to lead us more down the route of um, focusing one hip. Ben, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you decided uh, or how you go about deciding if a conservative path or a surgical intervention uh, is required for a patient. Yeah, I think first thing is um, a clear diagnosis is really important with this condition. So the hip is a bit different is if you look at the consensus for hip impingement, so consensus where I was lucky to be involved was the Warwick consensus. I think it came around 2016. To make a diagnosis of hip impingement, you need a triad of three things. So you need obviously symptoms, chronic symptoms. You're talking about more than three months. You need to have at least one test positive. So things like uh, the fat test, uh, the Faber test, uh, uh, resisted internal rotation. And the third is you'll always need an imaging, like an X-ray. You don't need an MRI, but you need something like an X-ray. So this is where it's a bit different from other joints. So, for example, if you've got a patient in your, in your clinic who comes with Achilles tendinopathy, you don't need an ultrasound scan to make that diagnosis. But with hip impingement, you can't confirm the diagnosis unless you have an X-ray. So that's where different. So I'm not saying like we need to scan everybody, but somebody who comes to my clinic, all I will do in my notes will say this patient is likely to have articular hip pathology pending an x-ray. So if somebody is coming, if I'm going to treat them as an impingement, if they're not improving, for example, in six or eight weeks, then I'm going to request through the GP to get an x-ray done to confirm the diagnosis because the diagnosis makes it important if they're not improving. So uh, that's a bit different from other areas. So first you need to know an accurate diagnosis. So uh, all condition of the hip will need an x-ray, whether it's an impingement or a dysplasia or an early osteoarthritis. And then uh, once you get those sort of factors there, um, now the most guidelines, actually there's a recent guideline which is published in BJSM, which I totally agree is you need to give them a good period of conservative care. So that could be anywhere from three to six months. So we need to make sure that you address the deficits. I'm sure we'll be discussing shortly about the rehab protocol. So they have a good 
uh, three to six months uh, of uh, a protocol. There are a few things which I, for me, which, which are really important, uh, which will sort of decide, help me to decide whether it's surgical or uh, conservative. First thing is the irritability. So we look at three key things. So Glenn also mentioned about sitting time. So sitting is very important, night pain and limping. So if somebody says, I'm waking up three times at night, I can't sit for 10 minutes. I can't walk for more than 10 meters. That doesn't look good for conservative. So they should not be too irritable uh, because then it's, they're too beyond their face. You know? So I look at the irritability, which is the key factor. So sitting time, the night pain, and the limping. So those things are quite negative. Second thing I'll ask them, which is uh, mechanical symptoms, painful clicking, catching, and locking. If somebody says it locks, it catches all the time, that is very painful. We're not talking about snapping hip here. We're talking about painful clicking and catching then it means there might be more extensive label damage, which is again a prognostic, negative prognostic factors. So somebody says they're catching all the time, you know, it's painful, it's like they're getting a sharp stabbing pain. And usually those patients will use words with knives like cutting, you know, catching, stabbing. Those sort of words means they're more likely to be more articular and deep and progression as well. So those are not really good on that as well. And the, the third and most important would be is the level of you know, symptoms which provoke the symptoms. So you got, let's imagine you've got two patients here. One patient says, I get pain after 40 minutes of running and it's a bit sore for three hours. Whereas another patient says, I can't even sit for 10 minutes. So obviously the first patient is more likely to do better with rehab. You know? So because their my symptoms are mild and you might have good results because you can modify them at early stage. If they come, I think the main reason I think physio fails in my opinion is because they come to you very late you know, they have extensive soft tissue damage, they have got secondary issues, and they're too irritable. So the irritability and also the threshold of symptoms makes a huge difference as well. And the last uh, is the objective marker, which I look into is internal rotation. Suppose, let's, let's say you're a, you're a avid CrossFit guy, and who does a lot of deep squats, you know, that's normal. To do a full deep squat with good form, you need at least 25 degrees of internal rotation or more. Now, when I check you on the couch, you only have five degrees or 10 degrees. That's no, you can't improve that with physio and manual therapy or rehab. And your internal rotation is not uh, enough for that sport. So, 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 so the decision is quite easy there. You know, Either you stop the sport or you do surgery to gain the range. So internal rotation is a, a key factor I look at. So generally with most rotational sports, you need at least 20 degrees and above. Uh, if you have five degrees, 10 degrees, and you want to play football, hockey, and do CrossFit stuff, then the hip hip doesn't have the mobility to do that. So uh, the way, one of the simple ways I explain patients with the hip impingement is, uh, hip impingement is a normal phenomena. About 20 to 25% of the population have hip impingement on x-rays, but only few get symptoms. The reason is when your hip, uh, when you're the shape of your hip, doesn't match your lifestyle, you get symptoms. So it's a mismatch between the shape of your hips versus your demands of your lifestyle. Uh, so if you've got poor uh, range, you know, strength deficits, mobility deficits, but your uh, activity is not uh, matching, then you get symptoms. So it's not a disease, it's not a pathology. It's a mismatch between your hip morphology versus your uh, demands of your uh, sporting lifestyle as well. So it's never an easy conversation. Uh, I never rush people into surgery, but if people are struggling, if they failed a period of conservative management uh, and it's affecting that. And the, a key thing to emphasize here is uh, nearly all the surgeries done for hip is mainly for ADL pain. We don't push people for surgery because they want to do a PB. They want to do a marathon. It's for people about day-to-day -day life. They can't sit, they can't walk, they can't drive. Um, you know, those sort of factors are most important, which might push them into surgery. If somebody says, I get hip pain after two hours of yoga, that's not a patient for surgery. You know, that's something which you need to manage very conservatively. But if somebody says, I can't uh, play with my kids, you know, I can't, you know, have into intimate sexual relation with my partner, because nearly 90 to 95 percent of people with labeled pathology have pain during sex as well. So all those factors, day-to-day -day life, which we take for granted, you know, walking, standing, going to the shops, you know, all those sort of stuff. If that is affecting them and they're not responding, I think it's extremely reasonable to uh, refer them for a surgical opinion rather than just dragging them to endless rehab. Right. So you've mentioned you have a surgeon that you work with. Do you guys assess the patients together? And what are the key factors that you, you take into consideration when deciding on whether or not to go the conservative route or the surgical route then? 
so when we when we see them in the clinic, so it's uh, I work closely with the lower limb, you know, uh, Dr. Radha, who specializes in young hips. Uh, so what we tend to do is he also arranges more extra investigations, like a CT scan and uh, other investigation MRI. He wants to look at the shape of the hip. One of the things we always do as a team is uh, nearly all our patients will have a diagnostic hip injection. Uh, even with the best expertise, even even after seven, eight years, even the surgeon, we can never be 100% sure whether the source of pain is from the hip. So the patients will have a steroid injection into the hip joint, usually done under the theater or under ultrasound, and we look for pain relief. If a patient has a big uh, response to pain, then we can confidently say that the pain is from the hip joint. If a patient doesn't have good response, they're more likely to fail with surgery. We try to counsel patients not to have surgery. So if somebody, if you had an injection and made no difference uh, and the pain is still the same, then it's unlikely that the hip surgery is going to help them. If a patient says, I get my pain is improved by 50% and it stayed like that for two weeks, then it's sort of, it's a good positive sign. So we never rush people. So they have failed conservative management three to six months. It's affecting their ADLs. They had a, a further test and they also had a hip injections and they had good, good uh, relief. Then they might be a good candidate for a surgery. So it's never a rushed uh, decision. It, it, it can even take three to six months to come to that decision because uh, we don't want to make people worse. So we go through step by step as well. So this is the sort of the patient journey which goes through that. And, so, and it might be useful while there to give what are the different options here. So um, there are three key options here for people with young hip. If you have somebody with hip impingement uh, who has failed physio rehab for three, six months and uh, uh, you know possibly need surgery, then the surgery of choice would be a procedure called hip arthroscopy where they go in with a keyhole uh, shave off, you know, the extra bone, uh, repair the labrum. Um, now, important point to remember there is the rehab. This is something where a lot of patients are not given the right information. The rehab of uh, hip scope is as long as as tedious as an ACL. It takes nine months to one year. A lot of patients think it's just a keyhole surgery. They'll be in and out within two months. That is not true. It's very long. It's painful. Uh, they have a lot of flare-ups. It's but, you know, just like an ACL, it's not a quick fix. So patients should be mentally ready to have the surgery. So it's not just again going out and then two months they're running. It's not that simple. So it takes a lot of their time and effort. The, the way to improve their outcomes is something which we offer in our clinics is we also offer them a prehab. We offer them three months of prehab before the surgery because that can improve their outcomes as well. So there's some been one RCT which shown better outcomes with prehab. So all of our hip patients, we offer them three. So we've got a specific protocol we use for a prehab uh, to gain those sort of markers before they go for surgery. Uh, the second option is uh, if people have arthritis, suppose there've been a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, buzz in the media about Andy Murray's uh, resurfacing. So if somebody has failed, uh, you know, hip uh, rehab and they've got arthritis, then the only option is basically a hip replacement or a hip resurfacing. So age is not a criteria. Every month, I will send at least two patients who are in their 30s for a total hip replacement. So it's not like olden days. We can't say to people, oh, you are too old for you. You need to be 70 to have a hip replacement. That's not true anymore. So the ceramic heads, they can last for up to 20 to 25 years. So age is not a criteria. If you fail physio, your life is pretty miserable. You don't have to drag your life to 60 to 70 to have a hip replacement. Uh, the new replacements, you can go back to running. You can play a tennis. Uh, the ceramic hips last longer. You've got better approaches. So it's not, uh, it's not like those olden days where people lead a miserable life with pain. So if you've exhausted everything, uh, even if you're 38, 45, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it's better, you've got options there. The problem with that is only a few centers in the world offer that. You know, in the UK, there are only about 10 centers which offer that, you know, so it's, it's going to the right surgeon who can offer that surgery, isn't it? So I see a lot of people leading a very poor existence because they are in such pain and somebody has told them that they're too young for a replacement, you know, which is not the true, you know. So obviously, uh, obviously try physio first, but if you're done for one year physio, but you fail, please send them to the appropriate surgeon for the second opinion. Uh, nobody says you need to rush them, but I think one year of rehab is more than adequate. And then if they're still struggling, then maybe you can look into a replacement. So it's not like the olden days where a uh, hip replacement is like a sentence, you know, you can have a fantastic outcome on that. And the last surgery, which is very, very rare in pretty, pretty much is a surgery called PAO, 
peri acetabular osteostomy that's very exclusively done for a condition called hip dysplasia uh, uh, elaborate surgery usually done in teenage girls or early 20s so that is uh, beyond the scope of today but it's done at specialist centers so in the uk there are only four four five centers do that so it's important to know that so those are the three options hip arthroscoping uh, for people without arthritis with impingement second option obviously for people with arthritis who have failed lots of physio and injections would be a hip replacement or a hip refaces, ref, resurfacing young females who have failed uh, uh, dysplasia with rehab then the option is pa or periastable osteotomy so those are the three surgical option the the good news is all of them need extensive physio rehab you know so they'll need prehab and they'll need post op um, post op rehab which could be anywhere from 6 months to 1 year so a lot of physio input there to help those patients to get back into full activity which they want to achieve in those so those are the three options for patients when they fail uh, uh, extensive rehab then maybe you can take us through that extensive rehab process and what the key elements are to try to prevent someone from having to go under the knife absolutely so i think initially you want to look at um what's triggering their their pain yeah so if it's uh, increased volume in a certain exercise squats lunges or a certain sport then you might have to modify that uh, initially so you have to manage the load yeah so it's important we get that pain under control ben mentioned um steroid injections uh, a lot of the time we can convert clients that are waiting for surgery in that period of time because then once they've had the steroid injection a lot of surgeons won't operate for 3 months anyway um so it gives you a really good window to either get them very strong and robust uh, for pre pre op which gives them better outcomes post op in my opinion um or to have a good go at conservative management and and avoid the surgery altogether which again is the ideal scenario there isn't it um so load management volume um management in their training to get the pain under control that's the the first step once the pain is manageable we want to work on um addressing certain deficits around the hip Now I think as a profession we're pretty good at this stage. Yeah so we want to look at the hip abductors, the external rotators, and um, we do a lot of work uh, pilates based exercises to increase the recruitment and load around the hip while we're not putting them in too much of um hip flexion for example working on the the um trunk position if they're doing lots of squats trying to reeducate that so it's not in that forward flex position. Um so that's a really important part and a really important stage and we don't have a set time that we would stay there again we have some criteria we'd like them to hit before they they progress through there and then the next stage which again is a bit tricky with these particular clients is um getting them back into the gym now um you're not going to get symptomatic hip impingements in sedentary population yeah so they're always um athletic they're always playing sport they're normally always in the gym um so that's a main goal of their rehab to get back into those um activities. So this is where I think um it's a little bit unique what we do so we have set strength programs that we do with them in the gym that's specific to this client group. Yeah, so I think it's important to talk about squats. Yeah, cuz there's been a lot of debate on social media about squats and the um uh, if you need to have a, a a good form or not and i think in the general population that could be argued back and forth but in this population if they're squatting in a certain way that's causing pain and we educate them out of that and it offloads it then it's a it's a go to um strategy for us and talking about squat depth as well because again um uh, as a profession i work very closely with a lot of personal trainers and as a profession i think we're viewed as just being anti deep squats as a whole which um there's not really any evidence for that uh, in the general population and there's a lot of benefits to deep squatting yeah increased mobility um greater glute activation the deeper you go etc so you have to be aware of what you're limiting when you do limit the squat depth but again that does tend to be um particularly problematic for these individuals so we we do limit squat depth with these clients in their strength and conditioning programs and I'll, i'll give you an example of why that might be problematic so in the last um 6 months i've had two um ex competitive fitness models that have developed um symptomatic hip impingement from the volume of gluteal work that they've been doing various duck walks and deep squats and variations on squats um and they're reluctant to take that out of their program obviously because it's a big part of what they're training for aesthetically so um we use a combination of a modified depth on the squat and we often will use things like a smith machine which i wouldn't standardly use um for my general population of clients um but it does mean that you can actively control that hip flexion a lot better and then we always or always will introduce 
um, hip thrusters. Yeah, so we know hip thrusters will ramp up that gluteal activation as much or if not more than a deep squat. So what you're lacking from not going deep in the squat, you're you're compensating for with the addition of the hip flex of the hip thruster. Yeah. So um, again, if you want to know more about that exercise, Brett Contreras, kind of founder of that on Instagram, you can follow him and see reams of videos on on progressions. And what's good about that is you can go pretty heavy. So we have a, a very specific strength and conditioning program that we use with these clients, you know, that's tailored to them. So variations on squats where the depth is limited, um, but introductions of um, uh, exercises like hip thrusters. And again, what we're trying to do is decrease that sensitivity to the load yeah, and manage the volume, educate them on their condition, build up that base of strength um, so that when we then go for our ultimate goal, which is to return them back to sport, if that's a possibility for them, we can then incorporate some of the conditioning strategies that Ben will talk about and, and some of the tests that we'll do to see if they're ready um, to return to play at that point. But as, um, as Ben mentioned, it's a long process, you know, um, but I'm going to, I'm going to reiterate the point that I think a lot of individuals will go down the surgical route without the awareness of what a major undertaking it is. Yeah. So, um, they might have some friends that have had an arthroscopy on the knee, seen them back, you know, six weeks, um, two months back, you know, and, and they'll have a similar expectation of their hip. But as Ben uh, rightly mentioned, it's, I, I would put it in the same category as a, ACL rehab yeah so they need to be in it for the long haul if they're going to go down that route so it's six to nine months up to a year uh, they need to be willing to put in the time three to four times a week in the in the gym um so to borrow Ender King's phrase with the ACL we all, we'll, we'll say you know is the juice worth the squeeze you know are you willing to put that time in um if their sports um a big enough part of their life then often they are uh, but it certainly justifies a significant conservative um, approach beforehand before making that decision you know so see if they can respond conservatively prior if that's an option because the surgery isn't just a kind of very easy straightforward keyhole surgery i'm yet to see one of those yeah so um it's uh, it's six to nine months you're going to get to know these clients very well i actually find acls a lot easier because there's a very definite endpoint there for most of them that we know for if they do the rehab right and they put the time in they're going to get a, a, on the whole a good outcome whereas um with the with the hip clients they'll often have uh, they have a good outcome so the surgery can be very effective for a lot of of, of individuals but they'll never ha usually have a hundred percent so they'll always have a slight uh, difference in that operated side they'll, they'll never be quite the same as if they hadn't had the surgery you know so that's quite an important differentiator with these clients as well in terms of expectations so um, as someone that's had an ACL going through that with the with the end goal that I'm going to be as good if not better than pre-op and fortunately I'm 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 close to that um if my expectation was okay I'm going to do this nine months of really intense rehab and I'll still have a slightly you know uh a slightly problematic knee uh, it might be better than it was pre-op but maybe that maybe that would change my um, thought process on going going for the surgery so i think that's an important point as well so often um patients expectations aren't managed well enough pre-op and the conservative um, time that we give them is a good amount of time where we can educate them on what to expect whether they're candidates or not and to see if they get the positive outcomes from the, the rehab phase before they go down the surgery route a couple of things i want to touch on there but i want to first ask you about your patient proprioception following surgery as you've mentioned previously you've had acl surgery yourself and one of the elements of that rehab is proprioception is this something that you find with hip surgery patients you have to spend a good chunk of time working on is it something that they sort of tend to lose following surgery uh in the hip like with the acl absolutely yeah that's a part of our training we do a lot of work um on uh, both static stability in the early stages and then dynamic stability as well so we get them um, working on um, landing patterns and stuff like that and we get them um, working on their mechanics if they're going to be cutting and pivoting in their sport so it's a big part of our rehab um, throughout the stages really so we start off quite early on um, in a simple way and then we build up on that as they progress through their conditioning programs i think um, again to, to bring some similarities with acls um, they do tend to have a similar pattern in the sense that if you have a significant amount of time off of your rehab, you'll notice a, a quicker drop on that side of the of the hip um, proximal stabilizers and 
um, as you do in the ACL. You know, I know myself if I go on holiday for two or three weeks, my knee feels a little bit weaker on the left and the right. I have to, I have to amp up the uh, ramp up the training in the gym um, to get it back there. So they do tend to have that similar um, loss of um, innovation into the muscles afterwards that they have to just keep um, working on their rehab. It's a, it's an ongoing thing yeah so as as we've stressed with our acls it's a it's an ongoing rehab process really for as long as you want to participate in that sport and i think again touching on that um having appropriate warm-up drills yeah so making sure they're doing things like the fifa 11 plus on a regular basis at least three times a week before they um, participate in any sport when they get back to that stage educating them in that that's going to be part of their ongoing um, rehab when we discharge them yeah is there anything you think as clinicians we should be on the lookout for? So, for example, in ACL rehab, uh, your patient may develop problems surrounding the patella tendon or other issues. Is there something like this following hip surgery? Yeah, so there's a few actually, but one of the common ones is um, knee pain. So they, they often will develop anterior knee pain when they start to um, increase their exercise activity after a period of, of being offloaded. And I think... It, it brings me to a, another really important point. There's a few muscle groups that are really neglected in this, in this um, client group. Yeah. So external rotators and abductors, everyone kind of goes there. Um, but the adductors are often very weak and the hip flexors as well. And the quads. So the quads are a really important muscle group here. So if they've been limited on their uh, squats and lunges for a period of time by pain, it's understandable that they'll get a loss of quad strength. So when we're then, starting to increase that demand if they're lacking that quad strength there before we've um, regained it then it's pretty logical that you might see in, in a certain percentage of them some anterior knee pains and, and patellofemoral pain if you were to globally summarize your rehab phases uh sort of oversimplify them a little bit for the hip patients what would you say were the key points or criteria before they could move on so we want to initially we're looking at managing the, the load and the volume that they're doing and we want to bring their symptoms down in that stage yeah so uh, we're not they're not doing nothing in that stage but we're we're limiting whatever's provoking them so we might use vad scales there for example or questionnaires the hagos um questionnaires to to monitor their symptoms and Again, there's some crossover. So we'll start them with loading. We use lots of bands and things like that in the early stages. And we want to get them to a point where they can do at least 16 seated rice. Um, ex, uh, you know that test from the ACL where they're in, the, uh, they're in the seat and they're coming up on one leg and down. Exactly. Sit to stand on one leg, essentially. Um, so we get them up to 16 repetitions on there. We want to have a, um, at least a 34 second side plank hold. Um, and once they're starting to, we've got a few other criteria as well, single leg bridges and things like that. Once they hit the numbers that we have in our protocol, then we'll bring them into the gym and start loading them a little bit more heavily. Again, it's not a question of they're not doing any of the gym based stuff beforehand. We'll get them doing body weight circuits and stuff in the limited range before they cross over. So there's a lot of, a lot of crossover there, but before we start um, loading them, um, we'll have a few criteria as, as I've just mentioned before we progress through to those stages. And then when they're in the gym, again, as we do with our runners and with our ACLs, all of the um, strength criteria they're hitting is body weight linked. Yeah. So we'd want to have um, again, 50% body weight lunges, uh, body weight, leg press, 10 reps on one leg. So very simple criteria, but they're specific to the individual because they're body weight linked. All right, then we've got them to that end phase. Can you talk a little bit more on their return to play phase? I think, uh, you know, just not hips. I think any lower limb patient when they come to me, especially when they're chronic, you know, there are three burning questions they have in the mind. Uh, first is what's causing the pain. Number two is uh, what can I do to reduce it? How can I help it? Number third is when can I return back to playing? You can fill up anything, basketball, football, running. So those are the key things. Patients want to know when they go back to the sport because there's no point telling them that you're strong, your hip is more. They want to know when they can go back to the sport. So that is the key thing. And I think for me, I think the return to play st planning starts on day one. So it's not something which I bring up in the last stage. So right from the beginning, my end goal would be a patient would be saying, I want to do, you know, fireside football, you know, uh, at that level, I want to do like 10 Ks. So we start looking from the, from the back and then start preparing. And when you look into this, 
um, I think Glenn mentioned about the rehab stage. We can sort of, you know, initial, obviously, it's the rehab, initial rehab, trying to improve the work capacity, then going to the strength markers. Um, return to running is a big factor for this patient. So uh, making sure they have good uh, hip abductor strength, quad strength. Uh, like I mentioned in my uh, podcast on um, our podcast on uh, return to you know on the running, all of them will have a return to running um, program. So we're not going to get them from nothing to 5K. They'll get them to eight to nine weeks. And all my patients who do rotational sports, we strongly encourage them to do um, FIFA 11 plus. We we got some good evidence that the FIFA 11 plus the sports specific conditioning. You can't recreate that in the gym. You can't do that from deadlifts and squats. You have to do sports specific drills. So all our patients, we insist on at least one month of uh, FIFA 11 plus outdoor. Even if you're playing uh, rugby, I think the FIFA 11 plus, because it goes through the cutting, pivoting, all that. Uh, I still feel this benefit from that. So they have to do that. And then now when you come to return to play testing, so all our patients will have a process of return to play testing. So we can put that into grossly four groups. First is provocation testing. So when you talk about provocation testing, uh, we got a validated uh, uh, tool from Christian Tober on the Copenhagen squeeze test. So, you know, put them on a long liver, give a squeeze and see their pain. So normally, you know, uh, the pain I like them to be is between zero to three, zero to two. So zero to two is okay. Three to five, you need to be cautious and more than six is not good. So we want to test them with some provocation. So you can use the Copenhagen's squeeze test for that. The second thing is strength testing. So this is where I think, um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, you need some measure like a handle dynamometer or a isokinetic testing. So we go with the um, handle dynamometer. And we, if you look at the evidence here for rotational sports, for a recreational population, we, we go for an adductor abductor ratio of 1 is to 1.2. So the adductor should be 1.2 times stronger than the abductors. That's for the recreational population. If you're dealing with a higher population, like a more semi-professional, we take it up to 1.5 to 1.6. So the adductor abductor ratio is massively important on hip patient when they go back to sports. And I think uh, you need something reliable like a handle dynamometer to measure that. So if a patient has a adductor abductor ratio of 0.8, that's a fail. I won't let them back into rotational sports. So they have to pass that. I only deal with um, recreational sports, so it's between 1 to 1.2. So you need to have some strength testing. Um, and you might also do some testing for the, uh, for the kinetic chain. Uh, one area which is neglected in the hip is uh, trunk. Trunk stability has a big effect on your pelvis movement as well. So, you know, your side planks, your rotational chops, and also quad strength, calf, uh, calf endurance. So you're just not looking at hip alone, you know. You will test the hip, obviously, abductor, adductor, but you also try and, uh, look at the movement control, the trunk stability, quad strength, calf strength. And once you've done the strength element, the third element is performance testing. So we have to push them with some performance testing. So you could use something, for example, a simple test like the agility T-test. So you can do a simple agility T test with three cones. If you need a bit of space, or you could use the medial triple hop test, which is very specific for the hip. You need something which is performance. It's like the hop test used for the ACL, similar. So you need to have some performance marking. I tend to use the agility T test and the medial triple hop test. So if you get a pain, it's a straight fail. So we're looking at performance here. Uh, full speed, change of direction, those sort of things as well. So that might be the same time they are doing the FIFA 11 plus as well. And the last and uh, very important is psychological readiness. You know, we know that fear of re-injury is, uh, is a very strong predictor for future injury. So if a patient has high levels of uh, re-injury, uh, they feel they are not uh, ready to go back uh, or they feel like uh, the hips are going to give away, then uh, we, we don't force them. So you, you can use a variety of forms, which is a psychological profile uh, to make that ready. So I think to put that into context is um, once they've completed the rehab, the strength phase, return to running, then um, you need to test them in four phases, provocative testing, strength testing, performance testing, and then definitely psychological readiness. And return to play is never a single person's decision. It's never my decision. It's, a, it's an MDT work. The patient in the middle, the surgeon, you know, the sports doctors, if involved, um, you know, psychologist, um, uh, therapist. So it's an MDT approach. I can, I, I'm never confident to say that. I'll never say that you're already on my own. So it's a, it's a collaborative approach uh, because it's a teamwork because, uh, you know, we are all taking care of the patient but it's not a simple yes or no. So we have to uh, realize the limitation. And uh, return to play is not an exact science. We need to use a combination of tests. 
we can't just say, oh, you've got good strength, you can go back playing. It's not as simple as that. So the performance, the strength, uh, the psychological readiness, and um, that also gives patients the confidence to go back. So uh, you don't want to rush that part, you know. So once once patient are hit, uh, finish the rehab and the strength, you want to take them all the way to the journey to get them back to football or um, basketball or hockey. So that's the journey on a return to play. You mentioned you guys have your own protocols and tools to assess where a patient is in their rehab. In the clinic I work at, one of the test clusters we utilize uh, for ACL patients is the cluster of Gustafson, uh, amongst other items uh, as an assessment tool criterion. Is there anything you can recommend or research papers for those listening uh, for their hip assessments? Yeah, so there's a, as I mentioned before, the, the evidence is like 20 years behind ACL. There's a uh, real lack of evidence on return to play in a FA population. Uh, so, but the thing is here is, you know, the bad minimum, I would say, is before we go into performance, we don't want to miss the deficits. Yeah, the most important, uh, you know, strong muscle group, especially in rotation, is the adductors. You must test their strength in some capacity. Even if you don't have a handle, you can use like a machine at the, the gym to do a, like a 10 rep max testing. So the local deficit must be addressed, abductor adductor ratios, those sort of things as well. And the hopping, the traditional Gustafsson, uh, you know, that was been good for ACL. I find, you know, the more sensitive and specific for the hips is usually the medial triple hop. Uh, that you find you can pick up deficits very quickly and the t-test agility t-test those would be my go-to test you can do and you can also add a figure of eight test as well you know the figure of test where you put two cones and then go around uh, you can you can i use it both for my foot and ankle as well i find it really useful for the hips as well so you got the figure of eight test you got the agility t test um, and then um, you got the medial triple hop so those Obviously, we we don't want to bombard them with ten tests. You know that just makes them. So I think two to three tests with some strength with some strength testing. But the most important thing is they should have at least completed one month of on field training. You know they should have done some program like the FIFA 11 Plus or something like that. You can't jump from the gym to the field. That's not you know possible. You need to give them something in between. Uh, uh, sports specific. And if you're not confident with that, you could work with a SNC coach or a strength and conditioning personal trainer who can give them sports specific drills, uh, which will involve them on the field, get them stronger for that. So I think that's where people miss it is that sports specific training, which is essential on the journey. What sort of athletes is it that you guys may see this often with? And what would you say about those sports is important for the physiotherapist to factor into their approach? You may have mentioned this earlier, but just to reiterate. And the second group we see is a lot of, uh, you'll be surprised, is uh, there's a lot of stretch-based athletes, yoga teachers, martial artists, because one of the things the labrum doesn't really like is end range loading. So people who spend a lot of time stretching out, you know, like uh, traditionally uh, yoga teachers and martial arts, you find they get a little bit of more degenerative labrum around that uh, in in stage loading. So uh, number one has to be rotational sports, uh, football, tennis, you know, hockey and all that. Then people who spend a lot of time in um, uh, stretching, that's a common group. The third group is uh, people whose job involves a lot of squatting, like personal trainers, you know, or who do a lot of squats in the classes, or they do a, people who join up for that. So those, you need that repetitive loading for it to become symptomatic. So uh, it's very, I've never seen in my last eight years, uh, a deconditioned, uh, an obese person coming with hip impingement. You need to really be pushing your body to the limit uh, to get symptoms. And usually these guys are very fit. They go to the gym, they take care of themselves. And they, in fact, they do too much. Uh, and many, it's exactly the opposite from runners. In runners, I have to encourage them to go to the gym. Whereas here, I have to modify them to reduce that. So a lot of times it's about load management and reducing their excessive uh, load on that. So uh, rotational sports, stretch-based uh, athletes, hyper mobile athletes, and uh, squatting. All those, that's your typical pattern you see. Uh, and they're generally very motivated patients. So they, they go to the gym, they like being training. So it's never a popular, it's never a question of motivation. I think with those highly motivated individuals, it's something I myself tend to have a hard time sometimes to deal with, getting them to take a step back when necessary. What strategy do you guys use for them? And Glenn, I know we've a, a mutual friend and training partner who you've been doing the rehab for post-surgery, Sam the future Patterson uh, and MMA fighter, uh, sort of David Goggins levels of motivation. 
how do you get those sorts of people to, to pull back on their training so they don't go too fast, too hard, too soon? Yeah, I'll share my thoughts and I'm sure Glenn will add a few points there as well. So I think this is a, I think I pick up this um, word from, I think, Gary Cook or you can't use a fitness solution to a medical problem. You know, so a lot of people use fitness as a cover up for the symptoms. So they push hard on the gym. So sometimes I make them realize like basic stuff. I go back to basics like ADLs, you know. So this guy must be doing marathons the weekends. He must be doing triathlon, but he can't sit for 20 minutes uh, and watch a movie with his kids. So sometimes it's a basic, I remind them like your fitness level doesn't really match up with your symptoms, you know, so basic stuff like ADLs, pain while putting shoes and socks in the morning. Those are, I try to reiterate that just because you're really fit doesn't mean like you don't have any pathology. So it's making the difference between the fitness and the pathology as well. And the second thing is also uh, the enjoyment of that. So I say to them, what fun is doing a game of football with a lot of groin pain? You know, let's get the pain under control. And then let's enjoy. If you're in pain all the time, you lose the enjoyment of the sport. You know, even if you're really motivated, if it hurts all the time, you'll get demotivated on, after a while. You can't squat forever. You can't run forever. So I try to get them back into the enjoyment with less pain. So get them aware of the pain element and also try to see that fitness is not really a, a solution when you have symptoms. So it's, it's a, I, I, I have to be totally honest, it's not easy at all because these guys have type A personalities, they're go-getters, they live and breathe in the gym. But, um, but, and sadly, they come to you when it's too late as well. Most of them come when it's too late. So they come limping and they come in severe pain uh, because they don't seek help because they think I need to train more harder. Yeah? So I think the, the benefit, I think we are lucky. We work with a lot of personal trainers. Uh, those are the people who pick up them first. So many trainers will send us the patients before the patients come. So I just had a patient yesterday, a guy who came in and say, uh, what bring, usually I ask them, what brings you here? Uh, my yoga teacher said, I, sh I should come and see you. He didn't come on his own because the yoga teacher was my previous patient. So a lot of times these cases are picked up by the teachers and personal trainers. So it's really important we have a good network with yoga teachers, Pilates teachers, uh, personal trainers, SNC. Those are the patients who, those are the people who will pick up this first and who will refer to us because patients will delay, delay. And by the time they come in, the outcomes will be poor. So it's working with a team there so we can pick it up. Anything you want to add, Glenn? Yeah, I mean... Uh... You mentioned Sam, so yeah. <laughs> Sam Patterson, for those of you that don't know, he's a professional MMA fighter that um, uh, me and Sonny both know. Um, I mean, he's a, perfect, he's a perfect patient in a way because he's so motivated, but like you say, um, getting people to, to slow down uh, and, and a lot of these clients have a similar mindset. I think a big part of it is education, you know, so um, getting their confidence in you as a therapist that you've got the same goal, which is to, which is to get them back to their sport. Uh, also to look at uh, timings with them. So you can't give them exact timings. They can't progress from one to the other until they meet certain criteria, but make them aware of the different stages. So you're not just getting them doing band work and Pilates exercises on the mat. You know, eventually you're going to get them in the gym. They're going to be lifting heavy again. They're going to be doing the return to play testing. They're going to be doing uh, more interesting conditioning strategies. I think a lot of these clients have had ongoing symptoms for quite a while. Yeah. So a lot, especially the ones we see in London, They've often been, you know, one to two years with these symptoms. So telling them that they're, they need to deload for a couple of months and then you're going to get them back to it after that point, it's a fair compromise, you know, because what they've tried to that point hasn't worked, you know, trying to train through it, trying to work through it, trying to go heavier, deeper, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and I think hand in hand with that is educating them on um, having a more balanced training program moving forwards once they are pain free, because what you don't want them to do is um, get a good outcome and then go straight back to squatting six times a week in the gym or a, a, a class, you know, they can still do those kind of activities, but they might need to be a bit more mindful about how often they're, they're doing them, you know, so um, reassuring them that, you know, for a big percentage of uh, clients, you're going to get a good outcome. You're going to get them back to where they need to be. Um, giving them some examples of previous athletes that you've treated, uh, giving them some rough kind of estimate as to when they're going to progress through it and just letting them be in the same uh, being in the same mindset as you really that your goal is the same as theirs which is to get them back to their sport not just to convert them into um, doing pilates and band work for the rest of their life you know so i think education is the key point there so would it be fair to say that education is a key factor then making the patient aware that you're on the same page aiming for the same goals but we've got to make sure we get there in the optimal way 
together. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and some things might have to change, like the certain way they do certain exercises might have to change, but um, I'm yet to have someone that's not happy with the, uh, the loading part of it when we get to that stage, you know, so they're still getting a very intense workout, which is what drives them a lot of the time and what they're, what they're aiming for with their programs. Awesome guys. Can't thank you enough uh, for making the trip back out. Um, you know, uh, as we finished up with last time, are there any last little bits and bobs that you'd like to add? Uh, little things that you'd like to mention to the community or any future dates of things that you guys have going on? I think we'd like to mention our, our courses. Yeah. So we've, we've got uh, our two day hip course uh, in 10 countries already this year, 2020. So uh, if you want to find out more about assessing these clients, then um, be, we'd love to see you at one of our European or international destinations. Anything you want to add there, Ben? Yeah, um, and this is a relatively new field. As I mentioned here, this is a lot of opportunity for physios to get involved uh, and specialize because they're more common than you think. Hip and groin is more common than you think. And what I find with this group is networking is really important. So we're lucky in London that we link up with surgeons, you know, sports doctors, radiologists. So it's having the MDT approach. This is no man is an island here. So I think you can't get the answers on your own. So I think we, we strongly encourage an MDT approach. Uh, that's what we push on our courses as well. Um, and uh, uh, myself with Glenn, we take a lot of queries on Twitter. So I'm on Twitter, Function to Fitness. Glenn is on Hamel Physio, so you can always contact us there. And we got the clinic web, uh, website, Physio Academy and uh, Hamel Physio as well. So a lot of ways to channelize that. And uh, we always emphasize on the course, we are also learning on the way. That's what makes it exciting. We're still another 20 years before we know the full answer. So uh, it's not the end. Uh, we don't have, we are waiting for some high quality RCTs as well. So really an exciting journey for a, a new or a novice uh, physio or somebody who wants to do something different. The hip and groin is definitely uh, and a lot of exciting options available in the future. Good to have you guys back. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll catch up again in the future. Cheers, fellas. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, enjoy your trip to Amsterdam. Well, ladies and gents, thanks again for listening in and we'll catch you next time. As always, wherever you're listening to this, we appreciate your time. And if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to get in contact and let us know. Until next time.